Hey, good afternoon and welcome. It is currently one o'clock. Um, we'll give it a few minutes before we get started, give an opportunity for others to join. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome and thank you for joining us for the State Water Resources Control Board's Water Rights Fee Stakeholder Meeting. This meeting is being held virtually through Zoom and webcast platform and also is being recorded. My name is David Ceccarelli and I'm the Fee and Revenue Branch Chief within the Division Administrative Services. Today we have many of the Fee and Revenue Branch staff working behind the scenes to ensure that this meeting runs as smoothly as possible. If any time throughout this event you find that you are having technical difficulties, please email us at waterrightsfees at waterboards.ca.gov. From the Waterboards Fee and Revenue Branch and assist me today in this presentation is Cassandra White. We also have staff from the Division of Water Rights and staff from the Office of Sustainable Groundwater Management uh, also uh, attending this meeting. Individuals attending via Zoom, please use the raise the hand function if you'd like to ask a question or provide a comment. If you're joining us through the webcast, you can also submit a comment or ask a question by emailing us. And again, the email address is waterrightsfees at waterboards.ca.gov. The email is also on your handout. In the past, there's been delays in the broadcast through the webcast. Therefore, through the meeting, staff may pause so the broadcast can catch up to the listeners. Again, we thank you for joining us virtually today. We thank you for your patience as we've moved into this 100% virtual meeting space. We're doing our best to ensure everyone can participate in an effective way. So I'd like to just go over a few meeting guidelines. Remember to use the handouts that were sent to you via email. If you do not have the handouts, don't worry. We will be sharing the documents on the screen. You can request a copy of the documents after the meeting, or the handouts are posted on the Waterboard's fee webpage. Please introduce yourself and who you represent uh, when it's your time to speak. 
Please mute yourself when you're not speaking. And remember, you can submit comments and questions uh, throughout the event um, to the email, and we'll take those in order we receive them. For the meeting to run efficiently and stay on track, we're requesting each participant who wants to ask a question to please ask one question at a time. I understand that you may have a clarifying question to your original question, and that's acceptable. Once your question is fully answered, we're gonna move on to the next participant's question and you will be put back into the order of participants who are requesting to ask a question. In addition, we respect all opinions and input. However, if the discussion starts to move away from the, ten, the meeting, which is to discuss water rights fees, then I'm gonna ask that the participant and I meet offline to coordinate these discussions further and involve appropriate staff as needed. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and review the agenda. Um, item number two there is uh, we'll have a discussion on the Water Rights Fund budget cost drivers, which is attachment one. Uh, item three is the Water Rights Fund condition, attachment two. And we'll also have a discussion of the Water Rights Fund budget change proposals, um, which is part of the cost drivers. So there are um, four... Uh, budget change proposals. And then we will go into some detail on staff's fee change proposals. Um, and then um, we have a standing item, um, as we mentioned at our last stakeholder meeting on a sustainable groundwater management act. Um, and we'll um, kind of discuss that as we get to this item. And then we'll have open discussion. And then next steps, which leads us to our September 18th uh, board meeting. So before we get to the to the agenda, um, I, I want to highlight um, <clears throat> uh, part of the budget, um, and this, we had this discussion uh, at a water quality meeting this morning. Um, and what I want to highlight is uh, there's a budget letter as part of the budget process. It's budget letter twenty four ten, and this was sent from the Department of Finance to all state departments. So in the 2024 um, Budget Act, it puts the state on, on a long-term fiscally responsible path and promotes government efficiencies through approved ongoing budgetary reductions in fiscal year 24, 25, and beyond. To achieve the savings included in the budget, the Department of Finance will work with all agencies and departments over the coming months on these required budget reductions. So to achieve a balanced budget, the budget assumes two sub-budgetary reductions. So one is there will be a statewide vacant position funding reduction of 1.5 billion in fiscal year 24-25. And again, when I mentioned billion in 24-25, this is statewide, so all departments, including the, uh, the water boards. In fiscal year 25-26, Finance will reduce another 1.5 billion and eliminate approximately 10,000 positions statewide via control section 41, excuse me, 4.12. In addition to this, there is a 7.95% ongoing reduction to departments state operations budgets in fiscal year 24-25 via control section 4.05. So finance will issue additional budget letters further detailing the processes and the timing of these reductions. In the past, the guidance in adjusting is provided late in fall after the board has adopted fee schedules. Staff are, are setting fees off of the budgetary expenditures that are currently in the Budget Act. At this point in the process, we don't know the total impact of these reductions since we have not received guidance from the Department of Finance. Staff does anticipate these reductions will reduce budgetary expenditures in our fee funds, and these adjustments will impact next year's fee setting cycle. In general, when our budgetary expenditures are lower, it results in less fee revenue we need to collect. So that again, to kind of recap, this budget letter is on the Department of Finance's website. It's budget letter 2410. Um, it's giving basically um, uh, uh, two basically sections to 
to um, reduce um, overall budget uh, for uh, state agencies. Again, we don't have the actual direction, the guidance, because those letters haven't come up. But again, I wanted to mention it because as we get into our next year's fee cycling process, at that point, we're definitely going to see um, these reductions hit and we'll be going into more further discussions at that point. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and move to the agenda. Um, and I'm going to toss it to Cassandra and she is going to present the budgetary cost drivers. Thank you, David. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first table shows a recap of the fee setting budget from fiscal year 23-24 at 34.9 million, followed by the governor's enacted fee setting budget for fiscal year 24-25 at 38.8 million, a net difference of 3.9 million or 11.2%. And I just wanted to note there is no change in the cost driver since the May revised budget. The second table shows what's driving the cost. The first item is state operations. It had an increase of 840,000 or 2.4%, mainly primarily employee compensation, such as salaries, healthcare, and retirement. The next item is pro rata. And there was a decrease this year of $2,000, which is um, less than 0%, a non-measurable change. Next item is CDTFA. And this allotment is for expenditures incurred for processing the Water Rights Fund annual invoices and collection activities. And there was a slight increase of $7,000 which is also showing at 0%, again, a non-measurable change. And then the final category was BCPs. The first one was establishment and implementation of in-stream flow objectives and the Scott River and Shasta River watersheds. The BCP amount was for $711,000, 2% increase. The next one is Information Security and Privacy Office Staffing BCP, which is $39,000 and 0.1%. The next one is New Groundwater Recharge Permitting Unit, which is 1.2 million at 3.5%. And then the final BCP is Administrative Hearings Office Special Projects, the cost is 1.1 million at 3.2%. And now I'll just provide a little more detail about each of the BCPs. So back to the first one, the establishment and implementation of in-stream flow objectives in the Scott River and Shasta River watershed. This BCP will establish and implement long-term in-stream flow objectives in the Scott River and Shasta River watersheds. The funding is for $711,000, and that is ongoing funding for two positions. The second BCP, the Information Security and Privacy Office Staffing. This is to enhance Information Security Office Staffing capabilities and establish a new privacy office. The new PYs will provide staffing needs in areas of privacy, technical security, and informational security compliance. And this BCP, the total amount of the BCP is $629,000 for four PYs. And the funding is coming from various funds, including WDPF and Safe Drinking Water Account, and the water rights portion of this fund, BCP, is $39,000. The third BCP is the new groundwater recharge permitting staff. And this will support review of recharge applications, implement new recharge reporting requirements established in the Public Resources Code, coordinate with applicants and the Department of Water Resources on future recharge projects, and help address water rights permitting backlog and support hearings for protest resolution. The funding of 1.2 million 
is ongoing funding to support five positions, four PYs in water rights and one PY in the Office of Administrative Hearing. And then the last BCP is Administrative Hearings Office Special Projects Package. And this is to expedite the adjunctive hearings and significant water storage and conveyance projects. The proposed positions will preside over and support adjunctive hearings and pre-hearing conferences, provide technical analysis review, and respond to public comments, participate in board meetings and briefings, draft recommended orders and decisions, and present recommended orders to the board. The funding of 1.1 million is ongoing for four permanent PYs. And I will hand it back to you, David. Thank you, Cassandra. So just um, again, kind of recapping um, the, the fee setting budget again, 34.9, uh, our governor's enacted fee setting budget currently is 38.8 million which basically is a difference of 3.9 million in, in additional revenue needs to be generated and which is about 11.2% change um, of that um, roughly 3 million of it is, is from approved uh, budget change proposals, um, which is roughly around 9% of the 11.2%. Uh, so let's go ahead and move to uh, attachment two. There's a question, David. Uh, yes, let's, uh, oh, okay. Um, Chuck, I think you had your hand up first. Uh, good afternoon, Chuck. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. And Chuck, can you, um, yeah. uh, just, can you introduce yourself and who you represent? Of course. Yeah. It's, uh, Chuck White. Uh, I work, uh, as a consultant to Manette Phelps and Phillips, who in turn represents Imperial Irrigation District, hence the reason I'm here today. Uh, I raised this question before related to these BCPs, and I'm struggling trying to understand if these BCPs are costs that are spread across the entire water rights program. For example, uh, state operations and pro rata, uh, and I guess CDF, CDTFA are all generally go going to cover costs for the entire program. Uh, but I'm always curious about these BCPs that they seem, seem to be fairly focused. And how can we get a better handle on how all of the water rights programs are uh, benefiting from these in BCP increases? Uh, for example, Scott River and Shasta River watersheds, I I'm, I'm assuming the only beneficiary uh, is water users related to those two watersheds. Uh, I'm not sure about the other three, but is there a way, to, and may, maybe not necessarily this budget cycle, but future budget cycles to kind of get a sense of, you know, whether these are uh, programmatic expenses that are covered by all, all uh, which, which the way it's budgeted now would be spread uniformly throughout the, all the fee payers, regardless of whether or not they have anything to do with Scott River or Shasta River or anything else. How, how can we get a better, well, and I, anyways, asking the question, to get a better handle on how these B B BCPs are specifically related to the various program categories that we're all putting uh, or paying fees for, uh, or are these somehow isolated that sh somehow should be covered uh, more directly with uh, specific individual fee payers rather than the, the entire uh, collection of fee payers? Well, uh, let me let me maybe answer kind of first part of the question, and if if uh, Eric or, or uh, Aaron want to chime in on this also, you know, over the years we have re re realigned uh, a lot of the water rights fees, so a lot of the programs are paying their share towards these activities, um, and every year we get closer to that of of uh, you know making proposals and adjusting applications and the petition portions and things like that of the, of the program. Um, so definitely when, when we do look at the BCPs, um, um, you know, we tried, we try to line it with, with some of the programs within the division to help pay for that. Um, okay. um, and we also, you know, we look at, um, uh, the areas of, of the workload and, and how, you know, the BCP is related to the program and where that fee revenue comes from. 
Um, so we do try to, we do try to line. I think over the years we've gotten better at doing that just because the fact that um, we've now have, you know, uh, um, aligning our fee structures with the workload within the division um, with, with the different programs um, and the different fee structures. So we've modified many of the fee structures and many of the fee structures had not been modified for many years. And we've incorporated new fee structures to cover the cost. Um, so I do, I do believe that we're closer to when we look at a BCP and those activities that, that, that the fee payers are paying for it. Now, again, you know, when you look at, when we do raise fees on, you know, uh, petitions and licenses, or excuse me, permits and licenses, um, you know, that, that workload is, you know, uh, you know, statewide basically covering all those staff and, and same with, you know, when we look at raising that, you know, the, the base and the per acre foot charge. So we, we do try to structure where we are, you know, covering those costs. Um, and with that said, I know Eric just uh, jumped in here. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. No, David, I thank you for that answer. I thought that was a great description and overview and yeah, I can get into a little bit more specifics. Uh, the administrative hearings, the groundwater recharge, and the information security BCPs, those are directly uh, focused on you know, the entire water rights program, whether it's pre-14 or post-14s. Uh, you know, we, we do uh, only assess fees on the, the post-14s, and it is specifically to ensure that basically those water rights that we're administering directly are considered appropriately when we're doing new groundwater permits, when we are uh, holding hearings, you know, it, it does touch on every kind of bit of the program. Same is true for the information security, right? There, there's information security needs and they apply to the entire division. The Scott and Shasta, that's a little bit of a uh, unique one. The board has been adamant before in saying that, you know, the distribution of workload is not specific for uh, one, I guess, one funding source specific to each kind of outcome. It does spread those funding sources across the entire water rights fee payers. Uh, there are fee payers in the Scott and Shasta rivers, and in part, it's addressing the redirected workload that we have uh, tried to do over the last couple of years where we are taking other you know, fees support, supported staff to work on Scott Shasta and uh, make that kind of more whole. So I know that's a little bit of a quasi ambiguous answer, quasi ambiguous response, but I think uh, that gives a, a rough overview. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, is it possible for this uh, fee stakeholder meetings uh, maybe not now, but perhaps in future years when you do have budget change proposals to, to, to kind of give at least a rough assessment. Uh, for example, those last three there listed there, you, you basically make the statement that they're reasonably distributed throughout the entire program. And so it's reasonable that those costs would be reasonably distributed as well. But there'd be things like uh, in the outer water, water quality this morning, we talked about Guala River again, and, and there's there's this uh, these issues related to Scott River. And I, I mean, I don't think there's major concern, uh, at least not from far as I'm aware of, of, of these small adjustments from time to time, a year to year that are, are focused on smaller individual watersheds that but I, I just how can we get a better handle as a stakeholder that we're not going overboard and directing very site specific uh, fee programs to the overall statewide unless it's clearly justified and I, I, I I'm not looking for a, a, a huge workload thing it's, it's just how can that be more clearly articulated uh, in, when we do these these annual processes to show that you know, uh, while there may be an exception every now and again, for the most part, you are trying to align the revenue sources uh, with the actual workload. Yeah, no, that, that's a uh, a good request. And, you know, I think we have tried to do that more so over the last couple of years, working with David and his team. We've, uh, like he was describing, you know, taking these steps to try and align the fees more directly. And I think you'll see more about that in the rest of the presentation where we'll get into some of the specifics, like where we talk about, and I, I know this isn't specific to the Scott Shasta, but it 
kind of gets to the same point, like the groundwater recharge, we are taking a look at groundwater recharge fees to make sure that, you know, we aren't uh, assessing too much of a new program on just one specific category. We're trying to distribute that workload and costs appropriately related to new application fees, petition fees, and kind of then just general fee increases more broadly. Uh, I think you know all, all these are listed in the the various budget proposals that come out, and let us think on that. And uh, it, again, it's a it's a reasonable request, and I, I think there's a probably a pathway to to work through it going forward in the future. Uh, we can circle back on it if that would work. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think Imperial Irrigation District is going to get up and scream about this thing when it goes to the board in September. Uh, but it would be helpful just to get a better sense of uh, how these more focused expenditures on certain parts of the state, you know, that from that may, that may occur from from time to time to be spread over everybody. But just uh, there's this, there's, at least from my standpoint, there's this feeling that we, we don't really understand your thinking. It's kind of behind the scenes, and you present these uh, making you your judgment. But I, I just I don't get a sense of how it's how it's related to the overall basic fundamental costs of the program as opposed to specific area costs. Enough said about it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat on it more, but anything you can do in the future to kind of give us a sense of that, I think at least from my from my standpoint in Imperial Irrigation District, they'd like to make sure that they're paying for legitimate things that are related to operation of Imperial Irrigation District and not going to necessarily, although there could be exceptions from time to time, as long as it's not excessive, uh, not going to other parts of the state. You know, pre appreciate your comments, Chuck. Um, you know, we'll continue, you know, it's a reasonable request. I think, you know, we'll kind of think about a pathway. Um, I, you know, I've been kind of talking about this for a while. I mean, we, we don't have like regional base fees. Um, you know, all of our fees are statewide. Um, right. And, you know, I, there's, you know, when, you know, the way it's set up now is, is you're right. When there's, when there's a, you know, workload in a certain part of the state, the whole state's paying for that. Um, but over the years, I mean, there's been projects in multiple parts of the state where everyone's paying for. Um Again, it's it's a reasonable request, and you know, like I said, we'll work with the division and and see, you know, how we can uh, be more transparent and articulate it, you know, as we go through the stakeholder process. Yeah, that's, I mean, Air, Imperial Irrigation District, I'm sure, doesn't mind occasional exceptions because of new programs or changes, and, and it makes sense. But I, 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 there's no way I can tell them. That, that whether or not this is under control as you as you suggest it is uh, and it is adjusted from time to time over the course of history but you know these last two years well this last year we got the Guala thing on water quality and the scott river and shasta river related to uh water rights and uh, i guess i uh, i'd like to get get a better sense of uh, make sure that's not getting excessive to focus on specific areas where those specific areas perhaps should be paying for it more directly themselves Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Good afternoon, Bob. You have your question, uh, hand up. Yeah, I did. Um, two two uh, items on um, the the and, and Bob, real quick. I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, can you go introduce and uh, oh, just who yeah. you represent? I, just for those that are on the call. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to get down to business and save time. Um, I'm Bob Gore from the Gualco Group, representing the. Kings River entities, uh, Modesto uh, Irrigation District, Kern County Water, uh, the cities of Antioch, Santa Cruz, Woodland, uh, Fresno, uh, Long Beach, uh, South Coast Water District in Orange County, the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, and a few other entities I'd be glad to send along if anybody's in the re remotely interested. Uh, how's that, Dave? Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, for the new uh, groundwater recharge permitting um, unit, and with all due respect to Dr. Ekdahl, um, this this is perfect for metrics going forward. How many permits? How fast? So we can see the value. S simple as that. And we can talk details later when we run into e each other. Um, on the AHO office, um, special projects implies 
temporary, interim, that they're going to go away after a while. I, I have the sinking feeling that's not the case. What are special projects? <laughs> you know? Sorry, my computer's having a little bit of a, a lag issue. Uh, so in taking a look at existing water right applications and petitions, and this is by no means the entire universe of what I think these special projects are, but it gives a good description. You have about 380 backlogged water right applications. When I say backlogged, you know, there's a lot of reasons for the backlog. It's not just uh, the board not having sufficient staff to work on it. Sometimes the applicant hasn't completed CEQA. Sometimes there are still outstanding protests. And one of the significant rate limiting factors in moving those forward is that to resolve some of the protests, you have to take them to a hearing. Uh, so, you know, 386 of those, some proportion have a need to go to a hearing. This is something the AHO can directly help us on. Even if it doesn't go to a hearing, uh, mediation kind of helping direct the applicants to resolve protests, resolve uh, you know, proposed permit terms, develop bypass conditions. These are all things that the AHO can kind of play a direct role in. The same is true for petitions. We have about 700 to 800 backlogged petitions. Uh, again, not all of them need to go to a hearing and not all of them are backlogged because of board staffing issues, it's the same for applications. Sometimes there are ongoing protests that need to be resolved. Sometimes there are ongoing CEQA issues that haven't been resolved and the AHO can help kind of put those under uh, time schedules and can help do the mediation, can help resolve all of those going forward. So with that level of backlog, uh, I don't view these positions as a short-term or interim kind of workload. I think these are gonna be around for a, a long, long time. And again, there's other things I probably didn't describe or didn't list there. And I don't know if anyone from the AHO is on. Uh, if so, they're welcome to jump in. I didn't mean to speak for you, but that's kind of how we see them overlapping. There's also larger projects like uh, two very, a uh, very large water rights application that is before the AHO now, for example, uh, and then a very large petition that was just publicly noticed yesterday. Uh, you know, these things are also potential workloads that add in. I saw the petition. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, Steve. You have your hand up? Yep. Uh, and I think it's been probably uh, Steve Haugen, Kings River Water Association. I'll take care of that business first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, kind of following in on Chuck and Bob's uh, comments, uh, looking at maybe more specifically like this groundwater uh, recharge permitting unit, and I had some internet connection issues, so you may have already answered this, but uh, I noticed you are adjusting uh, fees. We're kind of jumping ahead of what you're gonna be talking about later, but the question comes to mind, do those adjustments align roughly with this specific permitting unit? And are the, the fees that are being uh, assessed or, or uh, scheduled, do they kind of line up with that workload? That's a question that keeps coming up whenever we kind of look at these things. How how much of that program is being supported by direct fees versus this more statewide function? And I'll leave it at that. If you want to answer that as we work through the day, I'm okay with that. Thank you. And just, yeah, we, we, we did touch a little bit on this um, as we kind of talked about the the three BCPs at the bottom there um, are basically overall activities for the Division of Water Rights and that the kind of all fee payers and the way the fee structure is, is designed that those fees are supporting those activities um, and, are, and are in line with the, the increases needed. Um, but as we can talk about the proposals and so forth moving forward, um, we'll get into a little more detail here. Great. Thank you. So let's move to, I believe it's attachment two there, um, which is the fund condition. And I'm going to start by highlighting or discussing, uh, it's column three, which is the fiscal year 23-24 forecast. Um, and keep in mind, this is still a forecast because our accounting office has not closed the books 
um, on all of our funds. Um, we're probably still about a month away from uh, from submitting all of our fund condition statements to the state controller's office. Um, so looking at uh, fiscal year 23-24, um, we have an adjusted beginning balance of 5.8 million. It's 5.8 million is the carryover from the ending balance of 22-23. Um, we are projected to collect 31.2 million in regulatory fees, which brings our total fee revenue to 33.3 million. Um, and our total expenditures um, are projected to be roughly around 34 million, which um, uh, puts us in a slight deficit. So a structural deficit between total expenditures and revenue, about $600,000. But it brings our ending balance of 5.2, which is um, roughly about a 15 point, almost 16 percent um, fund reserve. Um, and of course, that's drawing down from 22.23, which was roughly around 19.4 percent. So we always highlight, um, well, what would it be if we did no fee changes? What, what's what's it look like? Um, and uh, our our total revenue would be roughly around 33.1 million. Our total expenditures would be roughly 38.8 million, which um, we'd have a structural deficit of about 5.6 million and putting us into the red um, with a fund reserve of about negative 1.2%, um, which uh, based on the Department of Finance's uh, rules uh, is that, um, that we cannot have our funds into a, a negative position. And so looking at um, our fee changes forecast for 24-25, again, I'll start with our um, adjusted beginning balance of 5.2 million. And again, that's our carryover from what we project for 23-24. Um, and we look at our total revenue at 35.7 million. Now I wanna highlight here that um, our fees from 23-24 are 31.2, and our projected revenue based on, on these proposals is generating 33.8 million, which is a difference of um, uh, 2 million and uh, $2.6 million. Um, and if you could remember when we, when we were just discussing our cost drivers, our cost drivers are actually going up nearly 4 million, a little more than 3.9 million. Um, so what we're doing here is we're actually um, using some of the reserve. So we're drawing it down um, and using the reserve, as you can see here. So our total revenue projected for uh, 2425 is 35.7 million. And then when you look at the total expenditures, our total expenditures are projected to be 38.8 million, which that does put us into a, a structural deficit in the year. Um, it does bring our ending balance about 2.1, which is roughly about 6%. So we are drawing the fund down. Um, when, when we originally looked at our proposals, um, and again, you know, the, 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 the cost drivers were roughly around the $4 million, about, you know, 11.2%. Um, we, we are, we are preparing some options to try to spread the fee over a couple of years. So guidance, some of this, uh, uh, some of this needed revenue, but at the same time, drawing our reserve, reserve down. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on that here just in a moment um, when we look at our fee proposal. Um, so um, I'm just going to look see if there's some questions. So Chuck, you have your hand up. Yes, I do. Uh, the, these, um, Hang on a second here. So you, you talk about the vacancies uh, that might, there might be a huge reduction in your um, budget due to eliminating budget uh, vacancies over the next, I guess, few months. Uh, and that I don't have a good sense of how that the potential sh shift in vacancies would affect these numbers. Uh, I don't think they're reflected in any of the numbers here. Uh, and I don't, I, I'm not sure. You don't you don't know it, what it's going to be until it is, and that, that's maybe a month or two away. But and I thought I heard, did I hear you say that well, well whatever the budget is for this year, you, you, you'll you'll adopt it or propose the board adopt it in September to provide this uh, 
5.8% fund reserve. And then if there's further adjustments necessary because of vacancies that are no longer funded, that would be reflected in the following year, not, not this current discussion we're having now. And I just wonder, have you given any thought to how much of a swing there might be with these, this, these pending vacancy uh, uh, eliminations? I mean, we're we're starting to do some forecast. Again, we haven't gotten that direction from the Department of Finance. Um, right. And, but, but what I but what I will say is, you know, when you look at the total expenditures of thirty eight million dollars um, in the fund, or thirty eight point eight million, um, and let's just look at more or less like the state operations line item of thirty three point eight million. There, um, that's that's the budget authority for state operations in. Uh, uh, for for the water board's water rights program, or at least the you know for the water rights fund, right. based on um, the language in this budget letter, um, that number is going to be reduced. We just don't know how the impacts of it, how it's going to look, but it is going to get reduced. So I mentioned this kind of uh, earlier that you know in general, when that budget number goes down, it just means that we need to collect less revenue. Um, which definitely would have impacts on fees. Um, I can't, until I see like the full numbers, um, you know, I, I don't really want to speak on what the options are, but, but you know, there's a potential that we're going to hold fees, you know, um, or maintain our fee structure. Um, uh, there's an option of maybe reducing fees. Um, but again, until we see that impact, um, and, you know, get the direction from the Department of Finance, um, then, you know, we'll, we'll build it into the numbers. Like I said, though, um, you know, we're, we're basing everything, of course, on the Budget Act right now. So if you open up the Budget Act and looked at the numbers, these are the numbers that are in there. Um, um, but the direction that we normally get comes more after we adopt fees and more like November, December timeframe when, when, finance works with our budget office to make these adjustments. So that's why I say that um, in the upcoming cycle, and then when we start the stakeholder process in March of next year, we'll have that all built in. And then we'll be coming to you discussing what these cuts mean specifically to, to the fees themselves. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's well understood. Uh, I just, I know it's not going to happen this cycle because you're not going to get the information from finance in time to be able to make adjustments. But uh, next year, I presume this will be front and center for discussion, assuming there is a large number of vacancies that are eliminated, that there's going to be some cost savings that could be passed on to fee payers. Oh, well, it, it, yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, the one thing we, and then and just but keep in mind, right, we've got you know, uh, when we come into our new budget cycle, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be calculating what these uh, what these reductions mean to the funds. What we don't know is if they're going to be approved BCPs. Um, you know what what the cost is going to be for that. So, um, we'll definitely again, you know, we'll be walking you through everything. Um, we've, like I said, we uh, just looking at. One of the items in the budget letter, which basically says there's a there's an ongoing 7.95 percent ongoing reduction to departments' budgets. Um, at a minimum, there's a potential of again the fund being reduced by that amount by eight percent. Um, but again, we just don't know how to kind of achieve that just yet. Um, but as as soon as we get direction from finance and running the numbers, we'll be as transparent as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll be reflected in the numbers, but it'll be a great conversation moving forward as we as we look at these numbers. Good. I, I, that's that's a good response. I mean, I, not, not, nothing's going to happen immediately this fiscal year, I suspect. But as soon as you can give us a sense of what the options are for up, upcoming fiscal years and possible cost savings related right. to this, that would be, that'd and, be great. And just just FYI, I mean, like I said, the um, the budget letter. Uh, it's 2410. It is posted on the Department of Finance's webpage when you go under mm -hmm. budget letters. Um, and, you, you know, you'll see the 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 two reductions that is directed against statewide, all state departments. Um, and then it, but it also says that, uh, you know, finance will be providing additional guidance, um, you know, in the upcoming months. So 
you know, we're kind of in this period of, of waiting for that direction. And then kind of once we get it, we'll move on it. Great. Thank you. I got it. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, Steve, you have your hand up? Yeah, just uh, kind of a observation. Uh, I believe for quite a number of years here, you have come in under budget, which I really appreciate. Um, <laughs> and with that, and knowing that you are likely to get some reduction in uh, cost with uh, implementation of these budget reductions, uh, you don't know the magnitude, but would it be prudent to maybe operate to a fund reserve lower so we don't end up, and I know you can't go negative, you're already trimmed it pretty tight, but uh, tightening that up maybe more into the one, one and a half percent range so we don't end up the end of next year at a, another 15 or 20 percent fund reserve. I'm just kind of thinking that through because we are seeing some pretty steep increases in some of the later rate schedules we'll be talking about. And I'm wondering if we can just kind of buffer that so we um, kind of spread that out over the next couple of years. Just a thought, observation. No, no, I appreciate it, Steve. I mean, the the comment on it, I mean, part of our proposal this year is drawing the fund reserve. So we are using some of that fund reserve to cover our cost. When I, you know, when I highlighted um, in the fee re uh, regulatory fees on the fund condition, Going from, you know, we're projected to collect around 31.2 um, and we're, we're projected to collect, uh, I think it's 33.8 um, yeah. in 24.25 based on the proposals. That's that's generating 2.6 million in additional revenue. When you looked at the cost drivers, though, on the cost driver sheet, though, the water rights fund is going up nearly 4 million, like 3.9 million. Yeah. So we are using some of that. Um, I, I hesitate, Steve, to try to draw this reserve down less than 5%. Um, I, I've seen it over the years, you know, we, we, we use it for, um, economic uncertainties. And I can tell you, of course, when COVID hit, um, we were luckily, we had reserve that we were able to use to cover costs and, and minimize fee yeah. increases and, and hold fees the way they were. Um, so, um, again, understandable, <laughs> but, um, you know, we, you know, we we try to we try to uh, maintain some type of you know prudent reserve, um, and you know, in the size of this fund, you know, five percent isn't really that much. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, you know, definitely a great question. Something that we do analyze and we you know keep in you know uh, back of our mind as we you know create these fees and we you know we look at the reserves as we you know try to maintain uh, again cover our costs, but try to you know minimize fee increases as best as possible. Great. Thank you very and, much. And Steve, I mean, and, and I, again, you know, I, we'll see how this plays out the next couple of years. Um, it may put us into a position where we're able to kind of, you know, work with um, how the fee structures are going to look in the next, you know, year, a couple of years, you know, based on these reductions. Um, and most likely what's going to happen is that we'll, we'll probably put together a couple of options and kind of like, you know, listen to the stakeholders of, you know, what, what may be, best option they'd like to see as we, you know, as we uh, uh, work within these, uh, you know, reductions to the funds. Okay. Appreciate that offer. And I'm just pausing here for a second. Um, I don't see any um, comments or questions through the email. So we'll go ahead and move to the next item. So again, as, as we mentioned, um, you know, we, we're, you know, we're needing to generate roughly 4 million, but based on our proposals that we're proposing, we're roughly going to be generating around 2.6 million. Of course, we're using the reserve to cover our costs, but we're also, you know, and, and that's also driving our reserve down. Um, our, our, our current fee structure for our permits, license, and pending applications, there's a, a base fee of $300. And then for every um, 10 acre feet of water or greater um, that the current fee is 0 0.109 per acre foot. Um, and so those that are less than a 10 acre feet are just paying the $300 base fee. 
And it's been roughly five years now since we've adjusted the base fee. And so our proposal is to increase the, you know, the base fee from $300 to $350. Um, that's a $50 increase. We recognize that, which is a percentage increase of 16.6%. .6%. So if you're, um, um, you know, less than 10 acre feet of water, you know, your fee is going to go up from $300 to $350, again, which is a $50 increase. Again, we have not adjusted this fee in the last um, five years. And then our other proposal is to raise the per acre foot charge um, by 10%, which the current charge is 0 0.109. And our proposal, when you uh, adjust it by 10%, is 0 0.120, which is a 10% increase. So we, we put together just a few examples. Um, of course, you know, one of the lowest, and 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 again, anyone under 10 acre feet of uh of um, diversion would be paying um a current fee of three hundred dollars. They again would go up fifty dollars, which is sixteen point six percent. Um someone at 20 acre feet of water um currently pays three dollars and one uh 301 and nine cents um their fee would be going up 351 dollars and 20 cents which is basically an increase of 50 dollars and, and 11 cents, which we kind of rounded but it's an you know an increase of about 16.7 percent um but looking at you know a mid-level fee payer that has a thousand acre feet of water uh, diversion, uh, current fee of $407.91. Their fee would go up to $498.80, uh, was basically almost a 91 cent increase. That is a 22.3% increase. And then, of course, our highest fee payer, which diverts over uh, 9.4 million acre feet, um, their current fee is 513000 and it's going to go up to a little over 564000 which is roughly almost $52,000 increase, which is a 10.1%. So basically what's happening, of course, is, is um, the, you know, the, the, the lower fee payers, the bulk of their fee increase is being based off of that $50 increase. Um, and then the middle ground here, which is, is has the $50 increase, but also a slight increase of the acre charge of the 10%, which roughly puts their increase of 22.3%. Uh, um, so again, you know, we, um, uh, we recognize that we do need to generate more revenue, but we, we are using the, um, the reserve to offset, you know, some of the costs of the program. We also do recognize that we have some other proposals that we're, uh, proposing like late fees and applications. And we, we recognize that that's going to project some additional revenue into the program. It may take a, you know, a year until we really see what that revenue looks like. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see how that, that plays out, um, on those two proposals. Are there any questions, um, regarding these proposals at this time? Okay. So let's move to, uh, next on the agenda, which at this point we have, um, um uh, we're moving into our uh of course our fee change proposals you know proposal a was the base and acre foot fees um the next one and we we had you know we had some good detailed um discussion about this at our last stakeholder meeting it has to do with our applica uh, application related fees and we have shelby on um, who's going to uh introduce this topic and its attachment for the agenda and Shelby, uh, yes. Great, thank you, David. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. My name is Shelby Witherby, and, and I'm a water resource control engineer and permitting section lead on fee changes proposed for applications. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add, David? Oh, no, no. I was just, um, your volume was a little bit low. I think we hear you now. Thank you, Shelby. Okay, wonderful. Yes. So, as mentioned, this is our second meeting growing out this proposal, and the first one occurred on June 26th. We are happy to answer any questions you have today and receive your feedback. 
or you can email the CEDS email if you have follow-up questions or input on the proposal. So for some context, this is a comprehensive update to the application filing fees and some associated fees. Many of these fees have not been significantly updated since they were established, most of them in 2003 with the establishment of the Water Rights Fund. So these fees have been due for a revamp. The fee structure can be fairly complicated with our applicants and for our staff to implement. So a key feature is going to be tiers. This keeps the same underlying approach of higher fees for larger applications, since the larger the project, the more work involved. We are honing in the fees, though, to areas where the projects are more complicated to process, including projects in the Delta watershed and projects involving onstream dams in the North Coast area. We are proposing an increase in fees for applications to acquire temporary permits for recharge. Staff focus has really been increasing on these over the last 10 years, and now over a third of permitting staff are focused on these temporary permit filings. We are able to see a lot of success in getting out these permits quickly. The board did lower the fees for these back in 2015, with an update in 2018, with the fees being currently much lower, more like 2 to 4%, than the 50% of the standard application fee normally charged for a temporary permit. We want to continue to incentivize these projects, but also see the need to bump up these fees to better cover our current level of staff focus on these projects. In addition, there is a budget change proposal moving through, as previously discussed, that would increase staffing specifically for processing of these recharge permits. I mentioned we want to continue to incentivize these. We've learned a lot about them and think we developed some good incentives that will help applicants have more successful project outcomes and also help our staff be able to process the projects better. The three ways for these temporary permit applications to reduce their filing fees are, first, if the application is received at least 120 days prior to the diversion season, helping party have approval in hand so they don't miss diversion opportunities. Also, if the party pursues a five-year permit, instead of repeating 180 days, they will receive a big cost savings, basically four seasons for free. And finally, we are extending the 25% discount we have on standard applications to the two types of temporary permits if the party uses the board's streamlined pathway to focus diversions on high flows, either based on historic gauge information or health and safety flight conditions. You may wonder about how much of the program will be covered with these new fees. The number and size of applications received is highly variable year to year, so it varies a lot. Our goal here isn't to get 100% coverage, but rather to bump up fees in a way that helps to bring more in line with modern workload. We do plan to have the fee tiers bump up slightly each year moving forward, as the fee staff have historically done with the application max cap on the map. So here we see our first fee is the standard application filing fee. This currently is a base fee of $1,000 plus $15 per acre foot greater than 10 acre feet, capping out at $648,914. We are proposing to change it to the following tiered system, which is significantly more straightforward. There will be a new project complexity surcharge of 20% for applications in the Delta watershed and applications containing onstream dams in areas pertinent to the North Coast and Jim Flow policy. These surcharges also apply to other types of application filings, like temporary permits. I'll discuss next. For standard applications, we will continue our current discount of 25% for standard applications for recharge using the board's streamlined approach. There is also a new footnote, which requires the payment of an additional standard application filing fee for applications for more than 40,000 acre feet at the price cap when an application splits into multiple projects. The 13 tiers are shown here. We see that the proposed fees range from $5,000 to $811,143. If you compare to current fees, the fees for a project asking for 40,000 acre fees is actually staying the same. However, fees for smaller projects are increasing to better reflect that regulatory requirements on small projects are still intensive. I also point out that tier 13 is proposing a higher fee for the largest project we receive of over 200,000 acre feet. 
And then we can continue on. Next, applications for small hydroelectric are occurring for the $1,000. I note that we rarely receive these types of filings. For projects under 10 acre feet, we are proposing to set this equal to tier one of the standard application fee, including the complexity surcharge. For projects 10 acre feet or greater, we are proposing to set it to tier two. An example here is shown. We see that the proposed fees range from $5,000 to $40,000. Next, our third category is application fees for 180-day temporary permits, other than for diversion to underground storage, which is currently structured as the greater of $2,000 or 50% of the standard application fee. We are proposing to keep this fee approach basically the same, except we are simplifying to just 50% of the same application fee for ease. Our fourth category is applications for 180-day permits for small hydroelectric, which are currently $1,000. For projects under 10 acre feet, we are proposing to set this equal to 50% of the tier one standard application fee including the complexity surcharge. For projects 10 acre feet or greater, we are proposing to set it to 50% of tier two. An example is shown here, and we see that the proposed fees range from $2,500 to $20,000. Next, we have 180-day temporary permits to divert to underground storage during high flow events. Currently, the fee is fairly complicated as the lesser of the non-recharge temporary permit application fee which has a greater than comparison baked in, or $5,000 plus a per acre foot charge. We are proposing to increase revenue and simplify this fee by moving back to the approach we used for 180-day temporary permits of 50% of the standard application filing fee. However, we'd reduce this fee down to 35% if submitted 120 days in advance of the proposed diversion season. We also propose to provide a 25% discount if the application will rely on the board's streamlined approach. The same discount we already provide to standard applications we make available for different things. Then we have our sixth category. Um, we could scroll down just a bit. We have renewals of 180-day temporary permits for underground storage, which currently are $1,500 plus an acre foot charge. We have been processing a number of renewals and found that these generally are the same amount of work as initial recharge filings, as the procedural steps are the same and new objections can arise with each filing. Thus, we are proposing to eliminate this category and have renewals be the same as an initial application. This approach will treat recharge the same as other 188 temporary permit applications, where initial and renewals be the same fee. Next, we have applications for five-year temporary permits, which currently pay the equivalent of five seasons of a 180-day recharge application. It's a very complex fee of $6,000 plus the lesser of the standard 180-day temporary permit fee, or $5,000 plus $10 for every acre foot sought by the application. Additionally, there is an annual component of 20 cents for every acre foot diverted. We here are proposing to highly incentivize this option by matching the same fee as the 180-day recharge applications. An example is shown which compares the fees under the current structure and proposed structure for three different volumes. Taking a look at a scenario application for 10,000 acre feet, we see that under the current fees for a five-year application, this will cost $20,000. The proposed five-year application fee would be raised to $66,500. While this fee is higher than our current, it is still much smaller than what a party would pay currently for a single season of a non-recharge 180-day permit, which is $75,425. Coming back to the example, we show for comparison what a party would pay to acquire five 180-day temporary permits which would be $332,500, making the five-year temporary permit a good option for those trying to reduce their costs. As with the 180-day, we are proposing a new option of 25% discount for streamlined recharge applications. 
Next, we have our eighth category, um, which is petitions involving a splits, which currently are $850. Earlier, I mentioned splits of larger applications above 40,000 acre feet. Here, the split fee is specifically for changes in ownership, but we also sometimes receive requests for splits for other reasons. For this split fee, the $850 fee will stay the same. However, if the filing is for more than 40,000 acre feet or more, the party will pay an amount equal to the uh, additional standard application fee that would have been due for having a separate project if filed separately. Our ninth category is petitions to revise de declarations of fully appropriated stream systems, which are filed when a party wants to pursue an application but must overcome the board's findings that no water remains to be appropriated and propose to increase from $10,000 to $100,000. These types of petitions require a hearing and are very complex and time intensive. And if we could scroll down just a bit to our 10th category, we have petitions for assignment of a state filed application filed with a water rate application are another type of action that requires a water rate hearing. We are proposed to increase these from $5,000 to $20,000. Next, we have re requests for a release from priority of a state filed application which currently are $5,000. We are proposing to update this to $20,000 for unnoticed or protested applications, $5,000 for pending applications that have been noticed with no unresolved protests, and $10,000 for a pending application that has been noticed with no unresolved protests that simultaneously seeks release from two or more state filed applications. And that takes us to the end of our table of changes. Um, yeah, we'd like to open it up for any questions or comments. Thank you, Shelby. Um, Chuck, you have your hand up? I do. Uh, it's a quick question, and I'm just curious, going through your excellent presentation. Um, I, I'm trying to get a handle on what the average increase is going to be. I mean, they're, they're all different, but depending on the size of the, the diversion. But it, is there a way you can characterize it like a couple sentences saying in general, you're not increasing them more than 5, 10, 15 percent or there's a few outliers? I mean, how would you characterize it? Well, the reason I'm asking, I've got to write a memo on this and I don't want to go do, do your whole uh attachment which is fine but I, how, how can i summarize kind of what what how much additional funding are you expecting from uh these overall multitude of changes yeah absolutely i'd be happy to follow up with you chuck about um yeah that additional revenue that we anticipate we did run some um some different scenarios based on historic um applications that we have received so I can yeah. send that to Um, but overall, I'll send you a note. I'll send you a note. Um, some categories are increasing by tenfold, and some um, significantly less. So, um, yeah, it's tough to. We didn't run a like overall average. Well, I guess I'm leaning on you. If you could provide me the the kind of a a snapshot of what, what the changes are. There's some big ones. There's some small ones. There's none. Uh, so I don't have to try to make something up. <laughs> it would be yes, helpful to absolutely. me. Absolutely. We do have the um, revenue example that I'll send along um, based on okay. current fee structure and the proposed. Good. I'll send you a note just to remind you. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. I don't see any other questions at this time, um, and there are no email questions. So we'll move to the next item, which is our late reporting fee. Um, again, we went over this um, uh, at the last meeting, um, just to kind of highlight that the water rights holders and claimants are required to submit diversion and use data to the Division of Water Rights each year. The board and other agencies, such as Department of Water Resources, Fish and Wildlife, and local water managers rely on this data for regulatory compliance, resource management, and water allocation decisions. The data are also the key component of curtailment and drought decisions. Unfortunately, 
compliance with existing reporting requirements is very low. As of April of 2024, there were more than 13,000 diverters out of approximately 41,000 that have not reported. Most of the oh, non-pilers, uh, about 10,000 divert less than 10 acre feet per year. These small diverters have not been subject to robust enforcement actions due to considerable staff resources needed for such a large undertaking. However, there's also sustainable non-compliance with large diverters. So there are 21 non-filers for diverters that report um, greater than 100,000 acre feet per year. There are 70 non-filers um, that divert between 10,000 and 100,000. Uh, there are 491 non-filers for diverters that report between 100 and 10,000 acre feet per year. And there are roughly uh, about 939 non-filers for diverters that report between 100 and 1,000 acre feet per year. So to help address this problem, the division is proposing to establish a late fee as part of the board's annual fee setting process. The fee would be based on one, the type of water right. So no fee for pre-14 or repairing diverters. Um, and then two, the size of the water right. And three, how late the reported data is submitted. Uh, late fees are not proposed for pre-1914 or repairing diverters, sometimes referred to as uh, statement filers and account for roughly 12,600 of the 41,000 diverters because the board does not have fee authority, uh, does not, excuse me, because the board's fee authority does not apply to them. So looking at um, our, our proposal, And so again, as um, as I kind of mentioned, it's going to be based off of size or acre feet, um, and also um, the 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 dates of uh, how late you reported um, of your filing. So, um, so for example, um, you know when you look at someone that's paying just a base of three hundred dollars, um, and if if they are filing, you know, thirty to sixty days late. Um, that's an additional $75 charge to their invoice um, as a late fee. Um, and again, you know, we there's a, we have a note down here that, um, you know, that, you know, you know, we are seeking, you know, we're working with our board members input, whether the fee is reasonable. Um, and so as we get into discussions, you know, with our board and our proposals, um, you know, we'll have kind of further discussion about this, but this, you know, we feel like this puts us, you know, kind of basically bet on a, a level playing field. Um, you know, uh, we, we recognize that, you know, we, we do believe it will, you know, help generate additional revenue. But over time, you know, we're hoping that it kind of plays itself out where everyone is reporting on time and, you know, you're not be assessing a fee. So, um, you know, you know, we 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 would like to, you know, we'd like to, you know, hopefully get everyone, you know, in line and, and report on time, um, and which then again results in us not collecting this this revenue. Um, but this is a proposal, and um, you know, kind of moving forward with this, um, the the numbers that you see up here are based on our our current fee structure of the three hundred dollar per year and the uh, zero point one zero nine for every acre feet greater than ten acre. Um, so, any questions on this proposal? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Um, Chuck, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I was just curious. You gave a bunch, a bunch of statistics on how the, the late fees and what a what a uh, drag it is on your program. Is that? It looks like you're reading from something. Is that something you could send out saying, "Here's kind of what the problem is that we're having is the delinquent fees, and it adds up, and here's what." What, what our, our your assessment is of, of what that is, and I, I could just send that along to folks and start to get a sense of you know showing what you're what you're doing and why. Yeah, I um I, yeah what what I was uh, kind of a uh, bringing up, I definitely we can you know I'll, I'll put it into like an email and send to you, Chuck. I'll work with um, yeah, with the division, but this is pretty much coming from uh, the division of water rights on on kind of part of an internal document that was prepared. 
I don't want to take anything it's uh, it's super secret or anything but if you yeah. and I don't want to create a huge workload but just something to get, kind of get, give give an example of here, here's what the here's what the problem is we're dealing with yes I understand Good. thank you thank you so we'll move to um we have a couple more other proposals um And I, let's see here, um, Cassandra, I believe you're taking D? Yes. Okay. So we have a couple of registration, you know, proposal change to the language. So for item number one, the registration amendment filing fee. So they're going to be um, removing some language and adding some language to make it consistent with the original registration fee. So because water code section 1228.7 doesn't mention anything about a petition, the process for making a change is to submit an amended registration and also the fee for the new registration for small domestic or livestock stock pond use is $250. And so in order to align the two, the amendment fee is lowered so that the cost so not to have cost be more than the original fee. And for item number two, the small irrigation appropriation registration fee, they're adding some clarifying language to address an issue. So um, at times a registrant who stops using the registration for cannabis cultivation may request to revoke their cannabis small irrigation use registration or CSER and replace it with the non-cannabis registration. The enforcement staff will not finalize a CSER revocation until the new registration is approved to cover the existing water diversion. So depending on the processing time of the new registration, the registrant may end up paying the annual fee of $750 for the unused CSER while waiting for approval for the replacement registration. So the additional language again just clarifies um, that issue. And that's it for me. Thank you, Cassandra. And then the last proposal, um, again, a um, little more language updates also, proposed change to the water rights, water quality certification fees. Um, the pr uh, proposals to simplify the water right related water quality certification fee, remove or modify subdivision B2 from the California Code of Regulations, Title 23, Section 3833. This would simplify the application fee structure such that applicants could more easily predict applicable fees using either section 3833.1 or section 2200, depending on the type of certification sought. This change would not be expected to significantly change fees for any other type of certification application, but may reduce overall division costs of processing certifications slightly. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention also, um, uh, as we you know, we uh, under our, our first proposal and in, in talking about uh, adjusting fees um, and in all these proposals, I do want to also highlight here, and I didn't mention this earlier, is that um, we are not planning on adjusting the fees for our, our FERC fees, um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission fees. Um, uh, basically looking at the current structure, the revenue that they're generating, um, comparing that with the staffing and the expenditures that we're generating sufficient revenue to cover that cost. Um, we, we also um, look at FERC's portion of their share of, of the fund reserve and, and all their shared cost. Um, and they, they are collecting, you know, under the current structure and, and the number of projects um, that we are generating sufficient revenue to cover the program costs. So I do just want to mention that, um, that um, we are not at this time not proposing to adjust the FERC fees um, in the water rights program. Um, so we will move on to the next item. And uh, let me get back here to the agenda, which um, is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, 
as we talked about, uh, you know, in our last two stakeholder meetings that, uh, you know, we are planning on trying to keep a, a standing item um, regarding the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, just to kind of, before I, you know, I, we do have uh, uh, Samuel and Natalie from the Office of Sustainable Groundwater Management uh, here um, to, you know, again, provide an update. Um, I will say that at this point, we are not considering um, adjusting fees um, for Sigma. Um, and, um, but I, you know, I want to just kind of pass along at this point to Nally and to um, Samuel, if you want to provide any update um, again on the new office and kind of, you know, you know, forward thinking or forward looking at, you know, how the, uh, how the program's going. And if uh, I, hi, yes, I can provide that update. Sorry okay, for the I delay know. there, getting my camera turned on. Yes, um, so we do have the new Office of Sustainable Groundwater yeah. Management, and um, we are continuing implementation of Sigma at the State Water Board. Um, as you mentioned, we don't anticipate any more fee changes this year after we changed our fee numbers earlier this year. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions regarding that. Uh, good morning, uh, excuse me, good afternoon, Justin. Yeah, hello, uh, so I don't know if now during, this is supposed to be questions. I don't have so much as a, a question as a, a general comment on Sigma probationary fees. Uh, is, is, should I do that now or should I wait for open discussion? No, this is a great time. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I'm Justin Fredrickson. I'm a water and environmental uh, policy analyst at the California Farm Bureau. And um, uh, regarding this item of uh, uh, Sigma probationary fees. Um, so back in April, Natalie will recall and anybody else who was at the Tulare Lake hearing um, the the amount of the fees and some other issues were brought up as a bit of a concern. Um, and we're continuing to hear um, from folks in that basin, but else, also elsewhere around uh, down in the valley and these other potential probationary basins that um, those not only those fees, but some of the metering requirements are, are looking like a, a, they could be a bit of a heavy lift for some of these folks, in particular, some of the smaller growers. And uh, and so I wanted to just speak to that a little bit. Um, I know I realized that the fees were dropped down from 40 to 20 uh, an acre foot earlier this year, and that's helpful. Um, but there there there's still a concern there uh, potentially. Um, and so this this concern was raised at the Tulare Lake hearing. At that time, it was mentioned that it was something that might be revisited, or there would be you know additional opportunities, including. Uh, these stakeholder meetings and the, uh, the the board's final adoption in September next month. Um, and we still have other sub basins uh, to come, including the day before the, the board September meeting, there's uh, there's the, the next one, the Thule probationary hearing. Um, so uh, it, it, with regard to these fees, um, they might not, you know, to someone at the water board, it may not look significant, um, but that if in itself, um, and, and that, that can be debated, but you have to take this in context and consider that there are lots of other fees and costs that all of these growers are, are, are dealing with. And so, um, and it's kind of the cumulative effect of all that. So everything from normal water costs, which are significant and going up, particularly during droughts, um, local Sigma fees, which are overlaying on these. And in some cases they're, they're quite hefty and they're, they're going to get higher if we're going to continue, continue impl implementing this act. Irrigate, irrigated lands fees, the normal water rights fees you were covering earlier, which have gone since 2002 when they were first started 7 million, they're now up to almost 39 million. So that's a five fold increase. All of these, these things layer on top of each other. Uh, any grower is going or any operation is going to have its, its normal administrative and compliance costs that also continue to go up over time. Fuel costs, energy costs, uh, fertilizer costs, chemical costs, seed costs equipment and capital costs, uh, transportation costs, labor costs, and on the list goes. I'm sure there are lots of other things I could add to that. So it's kind of the death by a thousand cuts sort of uh, thing. And um, for some of the uh, the small the smaller growers who don't have, you know, tens of thousands of acres to 
you know, fallow or, or, or um, uh, uh, makeup, lost income or, or lack of water, this, all of these things can add up. So, um, so, you know, we're Sigma, we're sort of figuring it out as we're going, I think both the, the water board and all of us. And so um, we're still thinking certain, uh, thinking certain things through and we're, I, you know, um, I'll also just mention in passing the, the, the metering, which is also a concern because that's an additional cost that adds on to this. The cost of installing a meter is significant and there's an alternative compliance option. There's some other methods, but there's no, it's sort of case by case. There's no clear way to do that in uh, rapidly. And meanwhile, we're bumping up against these, you know, these timelines where they were already supposed to be uh, measuring in July, uh, the middle of July. That's on pause right now, at least temporarily. But, uh, you know, then at some point, presumably they're going to have to be uh, measuring. And then they also have to pay their fees at the end of this year. So that um, that that uh, timeline is ticking away. And um, there's it's not clear how some of these uh, wells are going to get metered in the time necessary without some kind of alternative compliance. So I'm just mentioning that as another concern with Sigma. Um, yeah, so so uh, next month, the water board is going to be considering all these fees, including these Sigma fees. Um, we're still early, even with Tulare Lake. We haven't gotten to the other sub basins. We're figuring this out as we're going. And I, we do think that there could be some significant concerns. And so we hope that there will be considered um, consideration of, of these fees, how they're impacting folks on the ground and some of the practicalities, especially when you only have one year to try and get out of probation before you get into a state interim plan. Once you're in a state interim plan, it actually goes up to, I believe, 55 from, from 20 to 55 an acre foot. So that's even more significant. And um, so these are just all you know, not uh, hyped up concerns, but actual real practical concerns that I wanted to put on your radar. And thank you for the opportunity. And I'm happy to answer any, any question you might have for me on that. No, thank you, Justin. I definitely pre appreciate your comments. Um, uh, I, you know, Natalie, is there anything you want to respond to on that? We appreciate your comment. We're going to continue reviewing our Sigma fees for any potential adjustments, and we appreciate the information you shared here. Sure. Great. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you, Justin. So that moves us into, again, open discussion. I didn't have any topics on in the open discussion like I did for water quality. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, and there are no email questions. Which um, basically leads us to next steps, um, which we're again driving to um, the September 18th board meeting um, for, uh, for consideration and adoption of uh, fiscal year 24-25 fee schedules. Um, for those that have been, you know, are familiar with the process, that the uh, agenda item will be posted 10 days in advance, so approximately around September 8th. Um, and then uh, that'll be opportunity for you guys, for stakeholders to provide comments um, and then have an opportunity for staff and the board members to read those comments and if needed, incorporate that into our proposals. Um, and um, prior to that, of course, we'll be working, you know, internally um, and, uh, you know, briefing our board members, you know, everything we've heard uh, through our stakeholder processes. Um, again, you know, we appreciate all your comments and feedback. Um, staff definitely, you know, we, we, we take that and, and build that into our, our fee structures. Um, and then again, as I mentioned uh, in in the budget process, part of the next steps too are to you know finalize our budgets, you know, with these reductions, you know, you know later in the fiscal year, uh, which we see that these impacts are going to impact our our next fee setting cycle. And so I'm going to pause one more time just to see if there's any additional questions here.
not seeing anything. Again, again, I want to uh, thank everyone for participating today. Um, thank you for taking time out and providing us feedback and comments. Um, I want to thank uh, Water Rights staff, also um, Natalie from the uh, the newly formed Office of Sustainable Groundwater um, Management, um, and also um, I want to thank all the feed and revenue staff and behind the scenes who. You know, put the agendas together and then and, and uh, navigate through the slides and um all the information there um the audio of this meeting uh, will be posted roughly a week from today and again as i mentioned before um, this handout is posted on our fee web page um, so again um thanks everyone and um you know we'll sign off now and um everyone have a, a great rest of the week and a great weekend thank you thank you david